All right. Jason Resnick is with me. Jason is a freelancer that runs res with three Z's dot com and is also a well-known educator in the freelance community. He has a course slash coaching program uh, for freelancers called Feast. Thanks for being here, Jason. Thanks for having me. So um, this may not be your primary revenue stream, but I want to start with Feast. So why did you create it and what's been the best thing to come out of it? Well, for one, the reason why I created it was because I've been doing freelancing for a long time. Um, you know, I've been full time freelancing for myself in and around New York City for almost eight years um, and the better part of 15 years while working, you know, full time. Um, and over the past several years, people have started asking me questions on how I built the business, how I been able to sustain the business, you know, being in where I live, being such a, like a expensive place to live and stuff. And, you know, for me, I just thought like, hey, look, I'm not anything special, right? Like, it's just how I've kind of shaped it and where I want to get to. Um, these are the steps that I took to do it. And so I always wanted to kind of formalize it in a way mm -hmm. um, to help other people, right? To be able to you know, kind of say like, hey, these are some of the hurdles that I had. These are some of the nuggets that I figured out. Um, you know, just really being on the same path as other people, but a little bit further down the road. So mm -hmm. um, that's why I created it. And and to be able to, you know, connect with other freelancers and see how they are running their businesses and hearing their stories and hearing why they do what they do, why they do why, you know, I mean, to be an entrepreneur is like, you know, it's right. almost like a punishment, right? Right. <laughs> but, but it's it's a, it's the why behind that that I'm always intrigued about and learning about and really connecting with people at that level and being able to do that through Feast, um, you know, is just that that fuel to my fire. Yeah. So, is that? Would you say that that's been the most valuable part of it is being able to make those connections with people and, and learn kind of learn where they're coming from, learn the, the, the pitfalls that they're encountering? Yeah, definitely. I mean, to be able to see, because the thing is, like, I, I'm all about, you know, learning from mistakes. I'm, you know, learn out loud. That's not a phrase that I've, you know, coined, but I've seen it all over the place. And just to be able to explore <clears throat> explore that with other people, seeing mm -hmm. what hurdles they have, um, hearing that, you know, I'll get an email saying, hey, look, I used this blog post that you wrote um, to solve a problem that I had. And, you know, that for me is like, hey, look, you know, it's a connection that, you know, sometimes you can't get when you're just doing service-based products and things like right. that. Like, you know, the services and stuff like that are designed to solve a problem so they're hiring you to solve that problem right um, this in, is more of a way that is kind of just shooting like sending out the experience that i have to other people that are starting to approach those same uh, points along that path right so is the is the learning usually just unidirectional like them learning from you or have you found that you've you've actually applied some lessons learned from some of your students or some of the people that you've had conversations with you've you've learned from them and applied those lessons to your own business yeah definitely i mean it's it's not unilateral right so it's definitely a two-way street and um because look there's more than one ways to do this right, right? um i do it a different way than somebody else right um we're both successful um but to learn how, like, um, I struggle with content writing. I struggle with, um, you know, marketing. I'm not a sales guy kind mm -hmm. of person. Um, I understand the methods behind these things. But, um, you know, to be able to talk to other people that that's their strength and learn from them and then be able to implement that for myself, um, you know, that's just, that's like a bonus, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so in um, promoting Feast, have you, uh, we'll, we'll get into WP Field Guides. I, I know you wrote a, 
blog post about that where you're talking about partnerships. Um, but have you developed these partnerships for uh, Feast? And has that been a way for you to kind of make additional connections? Maybe not people who uh, are freelancers or would be taking the course, but people who are kind of reaching a similar audience? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, to promote Feast, um, I've tried the, you know, hey, let's launch for a week of fall free stuff and try to get as many people into the top of the funnel as possible um, and do webinars and joint ventures in that way, sponsorships and meeting some really awesome people along the way. Mm -hmm. But I've found, like I said before, I'm not a sales guy. That's That takes a lot of energy out of me and it puts me almost in an awkward space because, you know, I like to be... <laughs> I don't know, smart about the, the, the marketing, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I don't wanna push Feast on people that might not be ready for it, right? right? So Feast is really tailored for more, um, you know, somebody who has been doing freelancing for a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, they wonder why they jumped ship from full-time job to do this thing, and then a couple of years later, they're still kind of in the everyday muck of right. doing the client stuff. And they want to figure out how they, like, what happened? Where did I turn wrong? So that's the target for fees. Mm -hmm. So, but I get a lot of people that are still have full-time jobs mm -hmm. coming to the site and things like that. And they have different problems, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to necessarily push fees until they're ready. So I've gotten a little bit more over the past half year or so, a little bit more smart about it and mm -hmm. really basically have them pitch themselves feast, right, when they're ready. So but depending on whether what they're reading on my site or, you know, if they're attending live Q&As, which I hold irregularly, but next year I'm going to hold them a lot more regular, um, you know, and just be able to say, hey, look, I also have feast, right? And this mm -hmm. is the thing. These are the things that these are the kind of conversations that are inside of feast that you'll find resources for and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, I've I've met awesome people like Kai Davis, Brennan Dunn, other people outside of the WordPress space with feast because mm -hmm. they kind of have similar audiences um, and having those connections, you know, outside of that um space for me has been great you know just to be able to talk to them and bounce ideas off of them because again they're a little bit further down the road than i am so and, and you made those connections by doing like joint webinars yeah. yeah just by i mean for feast what i did was um i have inside there is basically like a bonus video it's an interview mm -hmm. after each of the modules so each of the modules have like an expert that could talk to um, the topic that somebody just went through. Gotcha. Um, so Kai Davis is a part of them. Uh, Matt Medeiros is one. Megan Gray is one, right? So there are these folks in there. Um, and, you know, I just invited them to have a, a chit-chat with me about their business, what they've done, all related to the module that, you know, the lessons are based out of. Um, and then just being able to, you know, network go on podcasts and you know just kind of help their audiences in any ways that i possibly can yeah um you know that just kind of you know amplifies both places yeah so you said that you want to try more live q and a's you, you want some more regularity with live q and a's next right. year so i know you've been doing that a little bit this past year what what are some lessons learned doing those that you're going to apply and why are, why are you kind of doubling down on that strategy for next year? Yeah, for me, I mean, I think to be able to open the door where people can ask a question and get value out of the, asking that question um, is much more than saying, hey, on Wednesday, I'm going to hold a webinar, and for the first 40 minutes, you know you're going to get a presentation, and the next 20 is all about the pitch, right? Um, I'd much rather pitch for five minutes and say, hey, look, here's this thing that I'm doing, and you could click the button below and, and buy in if you want. Let's open the floor for all, any and all questions, yeah. right? Um, because people come to these things for different reasons, right? right? Um, and to be able to hear the questions that – they're asking, right, mm -hmm. um, allows me to be able to, 
not only address them there, but also hear what people, you know, what keeps rising to the top, right? right? So Feast is all about building recurring revenue and that kind of marketing techniques and tactics and stuff, building a sustainable business in that way. And that was intentional because those are the kind of things that kept being asked of me, Mm -hmm. right? Because living in New York, you know, chasing a project every, you know, couple of months because I was done with the project, that was not sustainable for me. Right, yeah. You know, so I needed a bit more of a predictable income. So, um, you know, that's what people ask me for. And and hearing those kind of questions, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's somewhat intentional and selfish on my end because hearing 15 or so questions over the course of an hour from somebody, that turns into 15 videos or 15 right. blog posts or whatever, right? Right. Um, so th- those kind of like reused content that I can just, you know, repurpose somewhere else. Right. So it, it eventually just kind of feeds back into Feast and you can add modules, bonus content, that kind of stuff. Um, yep. But you're still providing value at the, at the time to the people who show up to the Q&A. Definitely. So have have you noticed like people are repeat visitors or repeat at- attendees to those Q&As and has your attendance kind of been growing over time or do you think that the consistency is going to be what really gets you like the the, the growth that you want on those Q&As? Yeah, I mean, I def- because I don't hold them regularly, um, I definitely see re- the repeaters, right? <laughs> like mm-hmm. the repeat audience members, I guess, um, more often than you know, I would. And, you know, it's pretty stat, you know, pretty flat line because Mm -hmm. I don't have a regular time or a a month or whatever to do these things. Um, like last, last week I did one on Friday. Um, and I kind of just threw it up there, not really thinking of, you know, I was like, okay, it's a holiday weekend here in the U S and black Friday and people have got other things going on. Like how many, like four people going to show up? Like, I don't know how many people, right. But I figured, Hey, look, if I could throw this up, I'm going to be home anyway, and I want to do this. And if only four people show up, then those four people get all of their questions answered, right. and they get big value out of that, right? right? Um, and I threw it up, and there was like 40-something people that showed wow. up live. So you know, so you never know really what's going to happen. But I, I, I even polled those people to say, hey, look, would you want this at a more regular level? Yeah. Right, whether it's Facebook Live, I happen to use Crowdcast, whatever it might be, right? So they were they were all adamant on having a more regular thing, and I'll probably do it once a quarter, mm-hmm. and you know, let my list know that this is the time that I'm going to be doing these things, and just ha- kind of have you know people filter in in that way. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, I want to shift focus a little bit to WP Field Guide. So I was reading through your your blog, and you wrote this post about WP Field Guides, um, which was um, a product that was aimed to educate small businesses on WordPress development and best practices. The idea being that there were some businesses that were coming to you but couldn't afford your services or for some other reason weren't becoming clients. And so you wanted to have an offer for them as well. So sounds like a good idea on its face. And you say you spoke with other people in the WordPress community about the idea and they thought it was a good idea as well. Um, And then you, you went further. Like once you had these discussions, you threw up a landing page and you developed some partnerships with other businesses that were targeting similar uh, customers. So one thing before we get into the the results of, of that, um, I feel like some people, myself included, are kind of afraid of promoting something that they don't feel is ready and and even further worried about trying to get partners on board before they can like show the partners what they're even doing. So how were you thinking about that? And how, how did you reach out to these potential partners to say, okay, look, I have this product that's in the works. It'll be ready on X date. Uh, I want, I would love for you to be a part of it and maybe we could do some co-marketing. Sure. Um, so 
I thought very much the same way. Like, how can I pitch something that I don't have or it's not ready, right? Um, so what I wound up doing was I built out one of those field guides. And, you know, I created the PDF, the markdown document and everything, like all of the, I mean, Mobi, all the formats, right? So that when I went to the potential partners, said, here, here's one, Mm -hmm. you know, is this good? Is this cool? Is this something that, you know, would resonate with you and your company or your audience or whatever it might be, right? Um, And it, it, those conversations, I mean, for me, reaching out wasn't so much of a problem because I look at it like, I mean, I'm an introvert and, you know, if you tell me that we're going to a party on Friday, I'm probably going to kind of hoard in with the people that I know and not <laughs> mingle around. But from for whatever reason, like if I put my mindset into the, you know, if I put my mind into the, the frame that this is for the business, this is for growth, this is for the future, right? And I'm, I'm always looking at that those kind of worries go away for whatever reason. And it's just a mindset thing that I have. Um, And, but being that I was already reaching out to folks for my business, my services, um, even shaping ideas in and around my services to my current customers and just reaching out and saying, hey, I'm thinking about doing this thing. Um, I think you'll be a good fit for it is this something that you'd be interested in, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really all it is, right? Yeah. It's just a, a simple email um, with so, a simple call to action, right? Like yes or no. Right? Did you have so, relationships with these people beforehand or were these, yeah. okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there there were people that I looked up to and respected. I had conversations with them before. Um, and by conversations, I mean, it could have either been in-depth conversations on a podcast uh, or in a hallway chat at a conference, right. or it was just, you know, some tweets back and forth, right? Yep. It was just, it was something that it wasn't like I was coming out of nowhere and asking folks about, you know, mm-hmm. um, I, you know, I kind of always presented the idea that I want to add value to them before I try to like pitch. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, sure. There would have been great people to, you know, try and pitch this idea to, um, but I had never had contact with them beforehand. So they probably would have just dropped me into some spam folder and, you know, said, Hey, this is just another pitch. Right. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't want to be that guy. So, um, you know, for me it was, it was, I wanted it more as a warm contact rather than a cold contact. Right. Gotcha. And so then the, the pitch from there was that you do co-marketing, maybe like offer a discount for your product if they bought the other product. Yep. Yep. It was a, it has to be a win win, right? right? Um, you know, they're bringing something to me, um, which is their audience. Right. Um, I need to bring something to them, right? So that's something of value to their audience, maybe at a discount, something that they haven't heard before or thought of before or some new tactic. Yep. Gotcha. Um, so ultimately, uh, you, you, you did the launch and, you said you got some sales, but it didn't it didn't work out how you'd hoped. Now, you said that there were some people that you didn't reach out to because you didn't have the connection with them beforehand. Do you think that maybe you should have been reaching out to more people, or do you think that it just it, do you think that it was the way the product itself was organized? What do you think? What do you think went wrong there? Well, I don't know if reaching out to more people would have made that much of a difference. Um, I might have gotten a few more sales, but ultimately, you know, like I folded up and I closed it up because what I found was I was scratching an itch for a very small number of people, right? So like the reason why people come to me, like you said initially, field guides was an intentional downsell so to speak right Mm -hmm. it was something where i could offer a prospect of mine that didn't sign on with me as my monthly service that could say hey look you know here's some you know ebooks on how to do this yourself right well in thinking about it they're coming to me because they want the work done for them right right? they don't want to do it themselves so i was 
I was trying to address something that I thought there was a market for and, and I built something that there wasn't really a market for um, as the intentional downsell mm -hmm. because I looked at it from the perspective of me trying to push something out rather than what the market was telling me that they needed. Um, so that's ultimately why I, you know, I closed up field guides was yeah. because, you know, for me it was just, you know, it was, it wasn't solving a pain point that I, you know, I thought was out there. Yeah. So another concern that I have is like, if I'm going out and developing these relationships with people like these co-marketing relationships, and then the product that I have doesn't end up working out that it's going to damage those relationships with the prospective partner or, you know, the, the marketing partner, and they're not going to want to do a partnership for subsequent projects. Do you feel like that's a concern or do you think like that's, that's not, not something that we should be worrying about? Um, I don't know if it's something, I don't think it's as big of a concern as it should be. Uh, or let me say that again. I don't think it's as big of a deal as 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 it may seem. Yeah. Because I mean as entrepreneurs we're always trying new ideas and trying new things, right? So even if you approach somebody with as a, a joint venture marketing partnership, as long as you're coming to them with some added value to their audience, mm -hmm. that's what they're looking at at this point, right? Right. If their audience doesn't buy into it, Right. Like, so for example, let's say it's a webinar, right? If their audience doesn't buy into it, meaning that they don't get any registrations to the webinar, then they presented an idea to their audience that didn't really resonate with them. Mm -hmm. um, and they're more worried about that relationship than maybe the relationship of the joint venture. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? So yeah. if you come, you have to kind of look at, at, some sort of marketing partnership as a win-win, right? Yep. You should always approach it from the perspective of what is the partner looking for from you mm -hmm. and what is the partner's audience looking for from th that partner, right? Because that's where the relationship exists. Um, you don't know that audience. The audience may not know you. So um, it's, it's a way in which to look more for solving a problem of the audience, not necessarily the, the relationship between, you know, you and the partner, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, because ultimately, you know, the relationship that, that you have with the partner, right? Like I've tried, I don't know, I couldn't even tell you how many different types of services and products at this point. Um, some stick, some don't, right? And, you know, I've talked to some people about it and they say, yeah, it's a great idea, right? Yeah. But then when you ask, would you pay for it, then they don't. So then right. it's not such a great idea, right? <laughs> right. So um, that's kind of how I look at it is, is that ultimately from a business perspective, if you're coming to an, a partner with an idea, you're coming, you need to come to them with a valuable idea for them. Right. Um, <clears throat> and if you come to them with not a valuable idea with them, then they're either just going to ignore you or – you know, you might fall into that bucket of, hey, this is just a, a guy that tries to pitch my audience all the time. And I've run into that a ton, tons of different ways mm -hmm. in which people pitch me stuff. And I'm like, can you come to me for free stuff? Like, you know, <laughs> if you want me to open the door to my list for you, um, what is in it for my audience? Right. right. Like, so, I mean, I you know, at least once a week I get an email from various different organizations and things like that trying to leverage my freelancers right. and you know I guard that list because I want to make sure that the relationship with me in the list is good not necessarily me and some partner that I might make a few hundred or a few thousand dollars off of once right so you're saying that it's basically the original pitch the original idea that matters and even if that doesn't end up working out as long as it like seems like a good natural fit if it doesn't work out then you know that's just the the nature of being an entrepreneur and trying stuff so you shouldn't really worry about that it's it's more just uh 
kind of the, the setup and being intentional about making sure that it's a win-win for both. Yeah, yeah. You always have to keep in mind them. Like, that's kind of how I look at it. Like, whoever the them is, whether it's a partner or their audience or my audience, I try to always be intentional about what's what I'm offering to mm-hmm. them. Right. So like, like I was mentioning about the live Q and a, right? Like, sure. I've done webinars where I've done the conventional way of talking for a half hour, 40 minutes, and then done a 20 minute pitch at the end. But for me, that's not, that doesn't seem as valuable as just opening the door for a live Q and a. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you also said during this answer that you've tried a ton of different projects, some successful, some not do you have a project that you would consider your most successful side project other than your, your freelancing business? Um, I would, I guess it depends on how you look at success, right? I think success can be measured in money, but it also could be measured in audience. Um, like what you hear back from people, mm-hmm. um, how it affects their lives, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, I think podcasting has been one of my biggest successes. I mm-hmm. mean, that's not necessarily a money thing, right? Um, I don't do sponsorships or anything like that, but um, hearing other people's stories, um, both whoever might be on the podcast, but also um, just the audience members, you know, replying to an email and telling me that, about what what they took out of the store, you know, the show or whatever. Um, but also, you know, I'm working on a new project called Evergreen Newsletter, which I think helps businesses nurture their subscriber list, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's like maybe just a month or month and a half old. Um, and I got that based out of just learning and listening what I've, you know, from forty plus other businesses that you know, I had sales calls with, mm-hmm. um, and deduced it down to a productized service that, you know, for a month old, it's probably been my most successful, um, you know, revenue wise, yeah. um, you know, type of side project. How, how did you have those conversations initially? Is that just through your freelancing business that you kind of sussed that out or were you deliberately going out and having these conversations with the idea for, Evergreen, evergreen newsletter in mind, or at least some kind of version of it in mind. Yeah, I mean, this was this was more of kind of falling backwards in something um, where, like, I use Drip. I've been using Drip for a number of years, and I took their consultancy course mm-hmm. and became a certified consultant of Drip. Um, and now Drip is an email automation platform, right? And it's it, I think it's a little bit more than just email, and I think it's more behavior, mm-hmm. right? Um, really, to understand what people are doing and what they're seeing, what they're reading, um, being able to tailor their experience with you, both on the email side as well as the website side, mm-hmm. um, based around the data that you know about them, right? So, um, for me, I decided I was going to build take what I've already done for my clients with Drip and WordPress and WooCommerce and all of the development services that I had and pull the Drip part out and just do that work for businesses. Because I felt that I could leverage the consultant, um, the certification uh, that I got through Drip, um, being in their directory and not necessarily being entrenched in WooCommerce, right? Because there's plenty of other people that are using Drip and do exactly the same, but leave aside the hardcore development stuff, right? Just be able to implement what they need inside a drip. And I had conversations for all these prospects, these businesses that were drip business, you know, they use drip. And were, no matter. Were you, were you finding them, were they finding you through the drip? Uh, some the of them were. Drip consultant. Page. Some of them were. Some of them were finding me through just conversations that I was having on social media about Drip. Some oh. of them were f- 
finding me through my blog. Yeah. Because I, you know, I have some, you know, I have several articles about drip and how I use it and things. So it was definitely a big mix, but, um, you know, just be able to have those conversations with various businesses, sizes, types, industries, whatever. They right. all kind of had the same problem, and that was the idea of a long-term nurturing sequence to pitch their email list to. So right. somebody had 100 people on their email list or 50,000, they didn't have any sort of, hey, I opted somebody into this lead magnet, and then they're kind of just waiting for that next email for me to broadcast out. Right. Right? There's no there's no natural sequence back in introducing the company, introducing, you know, even if it was like a coach or something, introducing themselves. So there was no, it was always kind of like, hey, here's your PDF. And now you just jump right into the middle of a conversation. And you're like, okay, I don't know who this person is. I just wanted this tool and I'm going to unsubscribe, right? Yeah. Um, so evergreen newsletter is basically does just that it takes some of your best content and drips it out to, to new leads in hopes of converting them into a customer. Gotcha. So we're approaching the half hour. So I, I want to sort of wrap this up, but what's one thing that you're excited to try next to grow your influence and grow your audience? I think it's just really being more intentional about when I hear a question, to be able to answer it, right? Um, I've always kind of just off the cuff, like, hey, you know, somebody tweets me or something like that, then I just kind of give them the answer or a link or something like that. Um, but I've been learning, you know, because I said before, I'm not a good, like, marketer or writer or anything like that. I'm starting to be a little bit more intentional about what the question is, but also what's behind that question, Mm -hmm. um, to see what that real problem is, hmm. uh, to be able to help more people that have a similar question. Gotcha. Awesome. So, uh, where can people find you if they want to get in touch or ask you about drip consulting or, uh, freelancing, that kind of stuff? Sure. Um, I'm at res.com. That's three Z's or you could find me on Twitter and at res too. Same cool. thing. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you joining us. Yeah, thanks. All right.